Father Bill Weary, 36 men's Curcio St. John's de Curia, uh, 1984, made that Curcio at Genota, um, pastor of Sacred Heart Church, Lewistown, and St. Jude Church, Mifflin Town. Very happy to be here with you for this next component of the three ages of the spiritual life. You've seen us already, some of you have it. This is the second volume and apparently you're taking a break from it right before moving up into the upper stratosphere of the spiritual life ready to ascend into the highest realms of the unitive way we're just ending the illuminative way right now the way of proficience you're to be commended for persevering Thus far, I really admire all of you. I admire this program so much for going through uh, Reginald Garagou Lagrange. And we are at the end of the illuminative way, or the way of the proficient. You remember, purgative way, illuminative way, and then the top is the unitive way. And you'll be doing that later. It's hard to talk about the way of the proficients when you don't feel that proficient and the way of perfection when you don't feel that perfect so pity your speakers it's very humbling but we try and here we're dealing with at, at the end of this section right as we end the illuminative way we are dealing with questions and controversies questions and controversies about this spiritual life differences of opinion among these very great lofty theologians and spiritual writers Differences among them about contemplation, whether infused or acquired, whether it is normal or extraordinary debates about whether such things proceed from the infused gifts of the Holy Spirit or from the virtues or just from basic sanctifying grace, all of which leads the perceptive reader to say, these guys need a hobby. Take up gardening or stamp collecting or something. They need to get out more. In these, and it really gets dotting the eyes, crossing the T's, hair splitting uh, controversies on, on the different aspects of the spiritual life. In these pages, we deal with contemplation, acquired contemplation and infused contemplation. Remember, meditation is sort of at the lowest rung of the spiritual life. Not to put it down, very, very noble. Meditation, it means pondering, thinking about the things of God. Whether a passage or an event from scripture or some quality of God or anything, meditating upon the virtue of faith or hope or love or, or in your Bible reading, your prayer time, in the morning, opening up the Bible as some of you do, and reading Jesus walking on the water or something like that, and thinking about that, pondering that, maybe talking to God a little bit about that. The, the emphasis with meditation being, the emphasis being human effort aided by God's grace. You don't do it completely on your own, but a lot of mental activity in, med, in meditation. A lot of human effort. This is the, if I may say, uh, the grunt work of the spiritual life, think Lexio Divina, you know, reading and meditating on scripture, thinking about it, and then letting God talk to you, which is a little bit of, a little bit of contemplation there. It can be very pleasant and enjoyable, but a lot of intellectual activity involved, a lot of picturing things in the mind, which is fine for this level. As God leads you in meditation and you get better at it, you gradually segue into contemplation. This is more 
of a loving gaze at God or letting God lovingly gaze at you, which he does, any, he does anyway, but you begin to perceive and experience that a little bit more with less and less thinking involved. There's some, some pondering, but less and less over time. Garagou Lagrange, the author, says that it may be accompanied by some distractions and with aridity. Or that means dry, aridity means dryness. That's comforting to me uh, in, the, in, in the area of especially acquired contemplation as you move uh, out of meditation into contemplation there may be some distractions involved so don't get upset about that people get all upset about distractions they give up uh, this is I'm not doing this right this is dumb uh, and, and Gary Gulera says well you know, there's some distractions involved next step in prayer is contemplation he says the first stage of contemplation is acquired contemplation defined as quote a simple loving knowledge of God and of his works which is the fruit of our own personal activity aided by grace a simple loving knowledge of God and of his works which is the fruit of our own activity aided by grace unquote almost sounds to me like a higher form of meditation as qualities of meditation still human some human effort considerable human effort involved but less than meditation now I was amazed by this passage which speaks of stabs of higher contemplation in everyday life and this example that he gives was really important to me as a priest and a preacher and he says quote this these stabs of, of contemplation that you experience you don't even know you don't even know you're experiencing it. You, you, you're doing it, but you are. Quote, this is the case with the preacher who sees his whole sermon in one central thought. And in the faithful who listen attentively to this sermon, admire its unity, and as a result, taste the great fruit of faith, which they see in its radiation it being a homily or the sermon I think that's cool so when I'm preparing a homily I'm in contemplation I don't even know it and there there is that there's a time when I'm preparing a homily I, I know that where it just really comes together and I'm like yeah okay it's a neat feeling also and I have most of the time when I step up to the pulpit and I'm thinking and feeling to myself, I can't wait to tell them about this. I'm really excited about this. And Gary Grange says, that's contemplation when you're preparing that hobby and it's coming together. And it's true. I mean, the, the preacher is, is, is meditating on the, on the truths of the faith or the scripture reading selectionary for that day. But also the faithful in the pew when, you're, when you get up. And that resonates with you and the homily sort of resonates with you. He's saying that's a type of contemplation. You are captivated by a you know, good homily that, that is contemplation. He says, there's a little terminology, they talk about terminology, especially between St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila. He says, acquired contemplation is the same as the acquired prayer of recollection of St. Teresa of Avila in her way of perfection. Don't worry about that too much. Terminology, semantics. Infused contemplation is generally defined as a simple, loving knowledge of God and his works, which is the fruit not of human activity, aided by grace, but of a special inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's ramped up a little bit. Here, God takes over more. This type of contemplation is infused, that is, it is placed in the person more or less directly in you by God. Your mental activity is lessened even more. You expend less effort. 
But in all this, I just I want to say also the, the will is never violated, kind of a paradox, even in the prayer of transforming union, which is the unit of way. God's taking over, we keep talking about that, but the will is never violated. Again, um, he says infused contemplation can happen in short stabs. Infused contemplation can happen in short stabs in everyday life. There can be a stab or sharp spike of infused comp contemplation. And his example, again, on the sermon is funny to me, and I'm going to quote it. He says, quote, for example, in a poorly organized, lifeless sermon, which produces scarcely anything but weariness in most of the listeners, the preacher may, however, quote a saying of our Lord, which profoundly seizes a soul, captivates it, and absorbs it. In this case, there is in that soul a manifest act of infused contemplation, because it is not human power to produce this act of the will." Unquote. Wow. You're nodding off at the homily. You're just about ready to zone out. <laughs> and Father Weary just says something or quotes a scripture, and boom, it zings you. You just needed to hear that. He says, it's not human will that's doing this. You are falling asleep on the human level, but something, boom, God grabs your attention. And all of a sudden, for 20 seconds, before you nod off again, <laughs> you're absorbed, you're captivated. You're sitting there thinking, yeah, wow, that's right. Infuse contemplation, before you go back to the other kind of contemplation, uh, with closed eyes. Now, when you're captivated by that scripture verse or whatever, that one jab from the homily and you're absorbed there for those 20, 30 seconds, imagine that feeling stretched out over 10 minutes, 15 minutes. That's perhaps the unit of way, the, the prayer of transforming union. Here he uses that beautiful example Oh, and you've heard it before, of the galley ship with oars and sails, like in Ben-Hur, that one scene where Ben-Hur is a galley slave, and they had those, you know, we have, you have oars and you have sails. The ship is our life, floating on water, which is grace. Grace is the water. If the ship was in dry dock, the rowing of the oars would not do any good. You need the you need the water, and that's why our, our human efforts in prayer are actually aided by grace. You don't realize it. They're really aided by grace, and that galley ship is floating on the water, God's grace. The rowing is meditation. Human effort is expended, but dependent on God's grace, the water. Now comes the wind in the sails. At first, the wind, which is another manifestation of grace or the action of the Holy Spirit, is light. It's kind of light. So some rowing is still necessary, but less. That's acquired contemplation. Then, the sails are almost completely filled by the wind, and hardly any rowing is needed. That's infused contemplation going up into the transforming union. Garagou Lagrange, the author, says, quote, Infused contemplation is not in our power. It proceeds not from our own activity, aided by grace, but from the more or less manifest, special inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says it's a difference not just of degree, but of kind of prayer. St. Teresa of Avila also uses the image of watering a garden. Basic prayer meditation is water drawn from the well in a bucket, the old wells where you have the crank and you haul up the bucket and maybe pour the, the water over the garden, sprinkle it over the garden, it's meditation. The water wheel, more of a mechanism, is acquired contemplation. 
Irrigation by canals, which fertilizes the garden, is infused contemplation, a little less effort, and then the rain from above is the prayer of union. The flowers of the virtues then bloom. Good news here. Generally speaking, we are all called to contemplation and to the higher realms of the spiritual life. At least Garibald Lagrange says so in company with other theologians who said so. Other theologians said no. And that was one of the controversies over the, over the centuries. Whether what we're talking about here is just sort of an elite thing for a few chosen, almost a predestination thing, a few chosen souls, and the others should be dissatisfied with slogging along in the <laughs> trenches of meditation, and that's their way, <coughs> and that's their uh, God's blessing <coughs> upon them. Excuse me. Um, Gary Lagrange, I think in union with St. Francis de Sales, Introduction to the Vow Life in the, in the 1500s, and other writers, and I think this wins the day. I really do believe, especially with Second Vatican Council, universal call to holiness, is that we are all called to the higher realms of holiness. That's kind of good news. I mean, I think that's an affir affirming thing, uh, that, that we are called to that by God. He quotes John chapter 7, verse 37, saying, Let anyone who thirsts come to me and drink. Anyone, Jesus says. Not everyone will necessarily heed the call. Perhaps few do. Many are called, but few are chosen, Matthew 20, verse 16. We therefore can humbly ask for the gift of infused contemplation, another controversy among the writers. Is it, is it appropriate to ask for it? Some would say, no, 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 just let, just, if it happens, it happens, don't be asking God for that kind of stuff. Gary Goulagrand says, yes, you can, it's okay. It's not an elite thing. You can ask for it humbly, in humility. That's appropriate. This book was largely written, I think it was largely written for priests, especially priest theologians who were spiritual directors. It's, it's largely these three ages of the, three ages of the spiritual life, uh, almost a spiritual direction manual in, in a way. And so a lot of what he writes about, a lot of this is written for priests so they know, they, they can discern what, what's happening in their direct, in their directee, what, when, when the directee is reporting various experiences and, and things to help the directee discern. So he says at one point that when the directee seems to be moving up into the higher levels, quote, souls, that is the directee, should also be continually reminded of the ordinary conditions of the union with God. You know, take him back down to earth a little bit, maybe he doesn't, so he doesn't get too full of himself or herself. What are the ordinary conditions? These are the spirituality one-on-one, -on -one, 101. Habitual recollection, complete renunciation, purity of heart, true humility, perseverance in prayer despite aridity, dryness. Great fraternal charity. The basics. You have to keep keep coming back to the basics. And then he says, if to these conditions is joined love of the liturgy and of sacred doctrine, the soul truly prepares itself for the proximate call to the divine intimacy. Proximate means near. It's right around the corner. Right around the corner. And that's how you prepare for it. How do I, how do I prepare for this stuff? And right there it is. I love where he says, love of the liturgy. You love going to Mass. Maybe the liturgy of the hours. Holy hour. Love of sacred doctrine. How many people are bored by doctrine? But the love of the sacred doctrine and all that other stuff, habitual uh, recollection, 
Perseverance in prayer despite aridity. Can't emphasize that uh, enough despite dryness. A lot of people give up, but you have to persevere. Infused contemplation, I believe, is just God. This is, this is my thought. You're not going to find this in Garagou Lagrange. God turning up the dimmer switch on the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are already there. I think it's one of the controversies. Some authors say that with infused contemplation, a new chandelier is brought in and, and hooked up. Garagou Lagrange says, no. It's the same chandelier. This is my understanding of Garagou Lagrange. The same chandelier, the same gifts of the Holy Spirit you've always had, especially the gifts of understanding and wisdom. The dimmer switch is just turned up on them. Those gifts are irradiated more by God's grace. Think of turning up the dimmer switch. He ends this passage with agreements and disagreements between St. Teresa of Avila and St. John of the Cross. And apparently a lot of theologians get into that parsing the various, they were friends with one another, right? Um, the two saints. Um, and, and any differences are very small. He does say, Garibu Lagrange does say, St. John of the Cross is more of a theologian. St. Teresa of Avila, less so. St. John of the Cross, more of an intellectual, the spiritual life. And St. Teresa of Avila, more experiential. I think you get that in your, in your, when you read the, their, their works. A lot of people like St. Teresa of Avila more, because she's more down to earth. I think Garibu Lagrange likes St. John of the Cross more. He likes them both, but I think he prefers St. John of the Cross because he's more intellectual and systematic than St. Teresa. But he says they basically agree on the spiritual life. I'm going to end now with a passage that Gary Lagrange quotes from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 7, verse 7 through 15. And as I read this whole passage, you listen to it as a striving for the spiritual life and the attainment of infused contemplation, wisdom uh, being a, a symbol of that. Therefore I prayed, and prudence was given me. I plead, pleaded, and the spirit of wisdom came to me. I preferred her to scepter and throne, and deemed riches nothing in comparison with her. Nor did I liken any priceless gem to her, because all gold in view of her is a little sand, and because before her silver is to be accounted mire. Beyond health and beauty I loved her, and I chose to have her rather than light, because the splendor of her never yields to sleep. Yet all good things together came to me in her company, and countless riches at her hands, and I rejoiced in them all, because wisdom is their leader, though I had not known that she is the mother of these, that she may be with me and work with me, that I may know what is your pleasure, for she knows and understands all things, and will guide me discreetly in my affairs and safeguard me by her glory. Thus my deeds will be acceptable, and I shall judge your people justly and be worthy of my Father's throne. De Calores.